in this talk, I will be using images to evoke uh, reflection. And uh, the, some content would also be from various studies. But what is important is to bring yourself into it. This is why I told Father Robin that even the prayer part also will be integrated. And let's make this as a kind of a integrated journey in a context of reflection and prayer. And I would like to bring this question, significance of consecrated life today. When that question comes, it means that there is something that is questioning us. And so therefore we shall go there to also look into from where arises these questions. And Robin shared with me a few questions. What will be the future? How will it be? How can we make sense of it, etc.? And we shall start with this day, May, July 3rd, Happy Feast of St. Thomas, the patron of India. And one of his significant moments, this is where I invite you to focus on him touching the wound of Jesus and proclaiming, my Lord and my God. Touching that wound of the risen Lord has transformed him and he has come to this land of ours and dedicated his whole life there, died there or martyred there. What happened in him through that process of touching the wound of the risen Lord? And I think there has something to do with uh, our own transformation and our mission. And in our times, we have been also touching some of the wounds of reality, our own wounds in, in us and in the society, particularly in this pandemic time. And so this question of a crisis or calamity, difficulties, questions regarding to the relevance of consecrated life, we shall begin with the word of God. The same word of God Pope used last April when we were all in a panic situation in Italy. At that time, India was more cool about it. And uh, people were dying nearly thousand every day. And uh, we have, it was a dead silence in Rome. I had an occasion to carry some Eucharist to a group of sisters. Practically, I was alone on the road. It was like a, a dead city. And you may have seen the scenes of Pope walking in the city and going to the church to pray to the, the church of San Marcelino. And then this prayer. And so we shall use that as our you know, takeoff prayer. Then he got into the boat and his disciples follow him. Suddenly a furious storm came up on the lake so that he, the waves swept over the boat. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us. We are going to drown. Or oh, don't you care? We can ask, we may have asked those questions in this pandemic time. So when religious life was questioned, sometimes we were humiliated, many things were happening. But Jesus was sleeping. The disciples went and woke him, saying, Lord, save us. No. He replied, you men of little faith, why are you so afraid? And he got up and rebuked the winds and the waves and it was completely calm. We would use this image for the church journey or the journey of consecrated life in a long history. There were times of storm, times of calm, there was growth and destruction in individual lives and in our congregation lives and even the religious life in general in history. We pause for a moment. How we have been living this pandemic time. The virus moved from one country to another playing havoc. And the last ones are India and Brazil. We are still in the grips of that. 
And some of my friends have told me their own families are afflicted now. And this is an unprecedented historical moment where the whole planet was under the grip of this COVID. And perhaps you may have followed that prayer in April. Pope walking alone in a slightly drizzling night evening for a prayer in which he invited the whole world. And he's on prayer before the crucifix and the water was falling from the, from the shoulders of Jesus down. A very special cinematographic picture that remains as a, a typical photo of this uh, pandemic times. But he was inviting to a mental condition to face that moment, do not fear. The one who calms the storm is the one who is in the boat with us, the boat of humanity. And we have seen that uh, the, the humanity has learned also to address within their own limitations, with their strengths and sins the way vaccine is divided and a lot of fake news and real news being circulated. It was a typical example of how the best and worst of humanity has also come out, either the service of or to take advantage of. It is in this context we also need to see our own, our own religious life. And I'm sure when uh, this touches closely, the difference between last year and this year in India was that India was hit very badly in this year. There, last week somebody sent to me the, the number of Indian suffered. Some of them I also personally know and grieve their pain. One of my own um, novices, one clarician also a young man was called by the Lord due to COVID. Our own four bishops, priests, religious brothers, nuns, and together, this number must be even more. And there are four, like fellow human, fellow Indians, and our own missionaries in different parts, sisters, brothers, priests, being present to families. And as uh, Robin was initially saying of this privileged stat status of the chosen one, why did not God protect his own chosen people? Why did he allow the priests, bishops, leaving the church more handicapped and fragile when she needs the most? The same happened in Italy, in the Northern Italy, more than 125 priests died of COVID, many of them by serving them, the people. And we ask this question, is there no privilege because we follow him? And the answer needs to come from our depths. What the father did not take the cross away from the Paschal mystery to make it easy for Jesus. Neither did Jesus run away from Gethsemane to save himself from the cross. So religious life is not for a claim of privilege, but to walk on the way of the Lord in hard times and good times. Whether you are in a privileged situation or in the periphery, our life has the same prophetic spirit. The scandals in the Indian church. Indian church faced an unprecedented period of trial in the recent decade. Media celebration of the scandals in the church one after the other. Bishop accused of raping a nun multiple times. I remember those days. 
when the flood was almost drowning kerala there was this breaking news the follow up of the arrest of the bishop and so on how important for a country that event or a state assassination of a rector of a seminary allegedly also through the accomplice of priests sexual abuses non fighting against their superiors with public support financial scandals ex religious publishing autobiographies of sensational contents which were also translated even to hindi and several indian languages which means people care for us they want us to be immaculate and good cases of suicides of religious and priests when one thing finishes another comes and there is a celebration with all this happening around among us how can you find meaning and joy in consecrated life maybe some of you have this question let's go still beyond to the struggle to be a credible church i had an opportunity to meet madre tina trinidad the founders of the opera of opera di chiesa a religious order not exactly a congregation and this woman is fallen in love with the beauty of the church this house of christ whom christ gave himself shed his blood and this beauty needs to be visible people needs to know but the last two decades were hard time of shame and pain for the church maybe mud thrown on the face of this beautiful bride of christ owing to the failures of her children abuse of minors sexual scandals falling attendance in the church and the people say the church is becoming empty decline in priestly and religious vocations particularly in the west traditionalist and postmodernists arrayed against the reforms of pope francis pope benedict and pope francis were committed to address the issues honestly and in humility again you can read it positively or negatively do you hear me there is some disturbance robin we hear but i'm trying to unmute now yeah i hear i hear so when we are surrounded by this is it worth dedicating one's entire life for a fragile church and her mission why does one go for it i am trying to situate the question of relevance in the context of the reality especially more painful ones and in the midst of this lot of work that is being done fine persons whom we meet are forgotten some of the finest human beings i have come across in my life belong to this category of religious but there is a silent work maybe in islam maybe in the remote the frontiers but then this uh, obscure part seem to be interesting or more visible in the world where media plays a big role to create truth and post truth in the midst of all these noises do i listen to a voice of the lord come follow me if anyone would come after me let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me for whoever would save this his life will lose it but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it unless we constantly return to this uh, the initial call experience we can get easily lost and to situate ourselves and our questions we need to ground ourselves so i like to begin with a story as an introduction please follow me with this story the ceo of a renowned company received an invitation to a concert 
on Franz Schubert's symphony titled Unfinished. As he was busy, he called the personal officer, Pio, and asked him to take his place and give him his opinion after the orchestra. So let's also go with the Pio for the concert. And here we have the ticket for you. Ready? Yes, Father. Please immerse yourself into this orchestra for two minutes. Not, not hearing, not loud enough. Did you hear? Yes, Father, yes, yes. Okay. Somebody was complaining they couldn't hear. That was also, also the complaint of the PO also. Next day, the CEO asked the PO, how was it? Did you like the concert? He replied, the report will be on your table this afternoon. The CEO was a bit perplexed, but he did not comment. And indeed, in the afternoon, he saw the file on his table titled report on attendance at the concert on 8th November 2000. Subject, I will read his report. Schubert's Unfinished Symphony. For considerable period of time, the four oboes had nothing to do. Their numbers should be reduced and their work be distributed throughout the orchestra, thus eliminating 
peaks of activity the 12 violins were playing the same notes their number can be reduced to 6 to be cost effective often the volume was not enough it can be achieved using an electronic amplifier a lot of effort was put into playing the 16th notes this seems like excessive refinement and i recommend that all the notes be rounded to the nearest square if it is achieved low trained staff can be employed at 20% reduction on salary there is a lot of repetition repeating the same passages played by the string section with the horn instruments makes no sense if these redundant passages were removed the concert could be reduced from 2 hours to 20 minutes finally i would like to point out that if schubert had taken these matters into account he would certainly have completed his work without leaving it an unfinished symphony maybe some of you also may <laughs> make similar kind of uh, analysis some years back i invite you to take a moment to apply this uh, parable i would say some 20 years back there was a court case by some female activists to relieve the sisters in the in the contemplative convents because they are suffering a kind of slavery they are not doing anything for the society only praying and the court verdicted that if they have opted on their own they cannot be removed they cannot be forced out they were and save our nuns and uh, people who want to save the sisters being oppressed in the convents and uh, see it as a this this life as something unproductive so there are very very many views on religious life from outside from economic point of view social point of view or left point of view right point of view it's difficult to make sense of a consecrated life outside its own logic just as an orchestra cannot be enjoyed outside the rules of music from a worldly perspective the evangelical councils do not make sense celibacy is ridiculous poverty is misery obedience is infantile caricatures of religious especially women as victims of power abuse and sexual abuse they need to be emancipated claim of perfection contradicted by all the scandals we hear abuse of allegations and scandals disqualify consecrated life in spite of all that i was observing this uh, recent negative propaganda rarely people leave consecrated life because of negative media propaganda recently asked when i was asked to give a talk to novices who were about to take profession why didn't they in our own times join religious life in spite of all this you no know, caricatures that are around and their answers surprised me that uh, they do not join for somebody else no they they have their own reason a uh, the other worldly attraction something that they couldn't find in spite of their own jobs and possibilities honest and open conversations about the questions raised by others and those we have within us can help us to go deeper into the true nature of consecrated life perhaps we have been too defensive when the offensive in us is stronger than enter into dialogue and listen to the questions which can also purify us and that is my attempt through this our sharing here how relevant is consecrated life today robin asked me this question is consecrated life in crisis does it have any future how long will will it survive is number all that matters what difference do we make as consecrated persons in the world well what is its future i was just imagining you no know, one of the religious going to a 
<laughs> fortune tellers, how long consecrated life will survive? Does it have any future? Honestly, I do not have that answer. I am not a fortune teller. However, we learn to accept the past, embrace the present, and welcome the future with the Lord's gift of faith, love, and hope. We have a way to find meaning in the supposed meaninglessness that may surround us. It belongs to the Lord of history to call people to consecrated life and to those called to respond to each epoch. The Spirit of Christ draws men and women in different moments of history to embrace the form of life that Christ chose for himself. There are a lot of things that belong to the Lord. There are things that belong to us. And this should be a joint artwork. So let us ask the questions differently. What are the data that raise many questions about the meaning and relevance of consecrated life in the world today? Let us not be afraid of the data. How do we make sense of this data in the context of the changes taking place in the world today? How can we leave our call to its full potential to render it meaningful and joyful for us and relevant in the world today? How to listen to the Lord who speaks through the signs of our times. So another image which I like to ponder, your consecrated life is an artwork of God and you, assist, you are assisted by many others in different ways. Your friends, companions, superiors, and so many are participants. But you and the Lord are the major protagonists. If you are an artist, you would want your friends to wait until you finish to begin to make final comments. You are an unfinished product. So every religious also go through a change in their own personal life. So I like to look at crisis from three points of view. The artwork of consecrated life has three levels of history. One is the individual personal history. We also unfold from our earlier stages and the novitiate and later according to age and even stages and its own tasks. So what I thought as a young man in the seminary is different from what I think now. The crisis and struggles of those, those days are different from what I go through now. There is an unfolding in a spiral way. There are moments of tranquility, moments of struggle, but what may be taking place is I'm able to embrace in a better manner, both ups and downs within the single whole. Then the congregation with its charism, it has a purpose to be in the church and in the world. It's not a casualty. And that also grows, a congregation grows through its ups and downs very hard times, crisis, and then religious life itself. The Lord leads religious life from the beginning of uh, the people drawn to follow Christ. And these 2000 years, it has also gone through a way of grooming from times of tempest and calm, growth and decline, and these three will be the way I would like you to gather with you to reflect. First, let us see each one of you, the individual consecrated person. You are on a transformative journey and I take one image from the nature, a butterfly. At one time it was a caterpillar dreaming to eat more than its own weight every day. You know that a caterpillar cannot move much, it's self referent it only eats on those leaves. What the caterpillar calls the end of the world, the master calls a butterfly. And the butterfly has less weight, it has to shed much of it by entering through the cocoon, maybe the moment of suffering. And then it has wings, it is able to fly, go around into the garden. And its concerns are different than that of a caterpillar. 
think of the concerns at one time in your own life. Maybe more self-referent make an impact. And as you grow, shedding much of the ego-centeredness and embracing a wider world, you may be more concerned about the others. Unfortunately, a good part of religious life is spent on the pains of ego than on the real sufferings of humanity. And this needs this uh, transformative journey at the individual level. And how do we accompany that? So your own personal experience of consecrated life is the first key for us to ask this question, is it relevant at all? How do you experience your own consecrated life? How do you see the traumatic stories depicted in the autobiographical words of our own brothers and sisters who left religious life? Some of them are really you know, very questioning. Is it all happening? One, one sister, I heard that she was not sister, but when she appeared as a sister, telling of stories of babies, cries in convents, etc. How do you accompany your own growth process and contribute to life in your life of your companions in community at the service of the world? Let's take the temperature of your own consecrated life. These days we are so used to this uh, COVID temperature taking. So take a minute if you have a paper and pen, it's okay. Rate yourself in the following scale of zero to 10. How joyful are you in your consecrated life currently? You're not at all happy or you are fully happy or five would be average more or less. Some people say, how are you? See. Chaltahe or pulling. Well, this can be changing. Sometime back you were very glorious and now we have the shifts, but that's part of it. I have not seen any religious who is 100 times, you know, 100 percent, 24 7 with Colino smiles. How satisfied are you in your community life? Not at all. Or fully. How fulfilled are you in your service, your ministry? Not at all, fully. Now I invite you to, to yourself, you as a subject together with God. How responsible are you for this happiness or frustration? And how can you move the scale towards the right? If it is seven to eight. If others are the cause of it, maybe you need to own up responsibility for yourself. And that's the beginning of a responsible adult life. How present is the risen Lord in your personal life and ministry? What is the combination of the divine and human partnership in your life and mission? How much free space do you allow God in your life? God is not much. I do things for God. There are various combinations. I remember one sharing with me a big change through a calamity that happened was that this person was very zealous doing things for God and their failure has transformed it. He began to see God does things through him. So the protagonism has shifted to doing things for God as a servant, a good servant to a different kind of a partnership. So this is called awakening from growing, we all grow in our wisdom, in age, and uh, kilos physically. But awakening is that makes the qualitative difference in our journey. 
is in that, that awakening that we will find more and more meaning to our vows and our so called dying to oneself so looking at your yourself even if the whole world tells you that consecrated life is meaningful and relevant for the church and the world if you do not personally find meaning in it you will lead a passionless consecrated life so there is a subjective side but there is also an objective side subjective convictions there is your heart side and your head side finding meaning is both of it together even if you are fully convinced that consecrated life is very meaningful and relevant for the church and the world if it is founded just for free labor in the church and not based on the gospel truth gospel of christ you are wasting your life so we cannot simply be a subjective certainty we also need objective certainty it should be something worth living and when we ask this question of relevance we need both personalizing and personally experiencing and objectively there is there the reason the lord is risen he walks with the church and i know him that the lord is alive so i ask this question who is in crisis consecrated person or consecrated life are you going through a vocational crisis in your consecrated life have you had any crisis in your consecrated life in the past how do you deal with the crisis situation in life what keeps you remaining in your consecrated life even when some of your close friends left the congregation how prepared are you to face your own old age and eventual death the absolute certainty all of us have do you want to live up to the full potential of your consecrated life these are fundamental questions which need to be asked at the level of the person so let's look into crisis crisis is something normal and common both in personal life in the life of congregation and in the history of humanity these three things which i am speaking what is a crisis crisis is a perception of an ex- or experience of an event or a situation as an intolerable difficulty that exceeds the person's current resources and coping mechanisms here in italy we had a crisis when the whole health system collapsed then they gathered strength and managed it and have executed very beautifully the vaccine system without crowds and uh, here in our community all of us are vaccinated uh, and there is a kind of a grip on the matter and now slowly it is becoming normal here one has developed capacities to address a situation when it happened there wasn't that inner resources or capacities in mental health terms a crisis refers not necessarily to a traumatic situation or even but to a person's reaction to the event many things happen because we do not know what will happen a betrayal of a friend a financial crisis but how do we handle and there comes the crisis management i have seen people some congregations even within the house they have used a uh, mask and they were very much restricted with a lot of fear so there is reasonably careful but at the same time you know more at ease to handle the situation the various ways this uh, current crisis is managed how people deal with a crisis when of aging adolescent to adult so life offers situations there are kinds of crisis developmental crisis both in the personal life and in the congregations it is part of growing and developing through various stages of life also called maturational crisis it happens when coping mechanisms in dealing with the stress common to a particular stage in the life cycle caused by a transition from one stage to another a novice when that novice has to deal with uh, real life situations we will see some of them one of that is identity crisis 
mostly happening in the adolescent stage and sexual identity and personal identity and to come off age we can say there is something nowadays called quarter life crisis it occurs in the mid 20s to early 30s after entering to the real world maybe many of the novices who or young young seminarians for us mostly it happens after ordination when we are really on the ground many of the things don't work the way theology is presenting itself and uh, sadly we with theology and philosophy we build the castles in the air and may have less chance of touching the wounds and this uh, process of one zone unfolding this leaves someone very frustrated recently i came, ac- came across one who has after his ordination if his goal is finished and there was no meaning and so he left mid life crisis feeling of unhappiness worry disappointment it may be coming perhaps slowly i am still waiting for my mid life crisis so i have passed that stage i think well maybe it has come and gone without announcing it some people experience at about 40 years of old and they can sometimes lead them to make important changes in life some say tired of being good or tired of the same routine life we want a change and they get into a kind of adventure leaving sometimes or you know then there is a existential crisis that can happen in different situations when our own value system is questioned inner conflicts are related to things such as life purpose spirituality midlife crisis one example of such a crisis and situational crisis usually with accidents or loss of things which are uh, unexpected things that shatter our uh, secure life or life visions uh, original organizational crisis it happens when leadership failures and issues related to internal f- functioning or external factors threatening the continuity of the organization it can happen to provinces congregations communities now when we have a superior who is maybe doing things which are not up to it or now um, very many things can happen and threaten hundreds of companies get uh, bankrupt and they close due to also crisis not managed properly you may be aware that the external business companies have short life than religious congregations there was a time companies with more than 500 workers used to have 65 years of life whereas now it is reduced to 18 years of life congregations generally remain at least 100 and a good number of congregations die within 100 years and we have also congregations that are over 1000 years we will come to it later there are sudden and smoldering crises in organizations often smoldering crises not addressed in time turn into major issues and crises anticipation and planning would have minimized most of them and the pocal crisis this occurs when human society goes through a period of transformation into something new and it is under our epoch this time is a time of epochal transformation or transition and this is why i am interested in that religious life need to participate in that all the ways of handling life situations are ill suited to accommodate the new changes it's a crisis that is simultaneously social economic and environmental raising the question of an epochal transition on the scale of the transition from feudalism for example from feudalism to capitalism etc now this we will come back again is consecrated life in in crisis because it is not suited to our times or consecrated persons are in crisis as they cannot cope with the changing times or the postmodern secular society with its human vision of the world find itself challenged by the gospel values enshrined in the prophetic role of consecrated life i think all these are together 
make the present condition uh, something that provokes reflection and confusion or questions, which we should not uh, leave unprofited. Personal crises are moments of growth and grace, and they are necessarily present in our life. To dream a, a life without difficulties would be infantile. We need to acquire the spiritual, psychological, and intellectual competencies to negotiate the crisis in life. Self-observation, listening, awareness, mindful acting, spiritual guidance, counseling. Then, you know, it becomes a joy to navigate through life and its own struggles. You don't have to wait for it. The Lord life offers that before you. And uh, we move from one to other. I will take this also and then we will take a small break. The congregation, life cycle of a religious congregations. There are several stages. A new congregation or a new community in a prenatal phase, 10 to 20 years, lot of energy, newness. Then there is a time of consolidation, 20 to 40 years. I have seen it in the life of provinces. There is a time of a stagnancy after an initial success and initial people do a lot. And then there may be a commodity sets in. People are not comfortable to go into peripheries or then jealousies, competitions. Stability and tendency towards decline in the second century in the, in the congregations, maybe provinces have lesser span of that. So we have reorganizations, revision of positions, etc within a certain period. Community stops attracting energetic and spiritually zealous individuals. As somebody was making a comment about uh, one group which was very you know, sophisticated and maybe more you know, modern. Those who have vocations will leave and those who don't have vocation and maybe trying an experiment may come in in groups. If we overlook the foundational values of consecrated life. Deterioration and death or refounding and transformation is the final stage. So this is why congregations go through uh, this decline and regeneration or death. Of the 105 orders that were founded before 1600, only 25 remained by 1972. 64% of orders founded before 1,800 are now extinct. And there are, it's, it's also natural, just as we have death, congregations also can die if we, if this regeneration and foundational thing or relevance uh, doesn't continue in the society. Dealing with congregational crisis, congregations or provinces can face growth promoting of or life-threatening moments. They can come from external or internal sources. The worst is the erosion of gospel values substituted by mundane values. We cannot live as a company on company principles. Power struggles and lobbying and then, you know, financial abuse and luxury, factions based on caste, tribe and language and the Asian or Indian congregations or provinces do struggle with this. Sometimes superior generals come to me because they are at a loss about their Indian factions because they can just understand why there is this Carolites or Tamils or North and South, various kind of factions and that, that create a lot of uh, you know, ill will and uh, suffering and struggle. Some of them fight till you know, with, with uh, force uh, to, to do away with other factions, etc. External are political interference and suppression. You know, there are communist governments or other governments who have done away with congregations. So what is the stage of your province and your congregation? We finished uh, two, the, the side of the individual, and one's own transformation, crisis, question, significance. And through that we grow also congregation and its own struggles, challenges, province level and congregation level. Now that congregational and congregations or religious life in, in the church and in the, in the world you know, 
And I invite your attention to that, to pass through that, the epochal changes and its impact. Coping with epochal changes. Some of you may have read the book, The Fate of Empires, by John Glapp, who studied 13 empires in the Middle East, Asia, Europe, etc., from 859 BC to modern Britain in 1950. And he saw a pattern of decline. And they all declined in the same stages. And it always took 10 generations, about 250 years. Each generation matures in better socio-economic circumstances created by the preceding generation. Thus, there is always a march to increasing materialism. Improved material conditions create attitudinal changes that insist on still more material attitudes. Changes and predictably because of its wealth and the erosion of morality, the civilization declines into decadence. That is his thesis. Margaret Wheatley also speaks of that and there are others too. Let's see the pattern. This is an age of pioneers. We can think of similar kind of thing in congregations, age of conquest and growth. This happens in these Chinese, Indian, you know, pharaohs of Egypt, Roman Empire, and so on. Age of affluence, and age of intellect, and age of decadence. In the age of decadence that Glub describes, everyone is focused on their own self-interest. Elites protect their wealth, leaders protect their power, and they even combine, we have seen in some places and the masses clamor for entertainment. So entertainment culture and we worship actors, musicians and athletes. Even in the presidential taking over, it is celebrities who are present no? more than intellectuals. A celebrity culture always arises in the age of decadence. We become obsessed with the lives of particular individuals, their talents and achievements. Cultures focused on popularity have no depth or resilience. The science of decadence is marked by defensiveness, pessimism, materialism, frivolity, and influx of foreigners and welfare state, weakening of religion. Seeing all that, some say we are at a time of decadence and a new will emerge or a change, an epochal change with uh, the emergence of now in the internet, social media, is replacing many old security things. And we need to learn to manage. We don't have to spend time on this. This is that you know, the, the rise and fall of the various embraces in 250. This is the story let's, of how one- Let us listen to uh, a small video about the Anthropocene. This is a concept which is, uh, nowadays used about these last years, within this uh, last, uh, maybe from 50 with industrial revolution, this, is, this epoch, um, the changes that happened in the last 100 years or so is much more than all that happened before the humanity's evolution for the good and for bad. So we are in a, a, in a epoch where the human beings control and therefore the responsibility is much and that is the context of this, this is the video. story of how one species changed a planet the latest chapter of our story begins in england 250 years ago fueled by coal then oil several brilliant inventions appeared they ignited the industrial revolution which spread like wildfire through europe north america japan then elsewhere the great railways, then cars and highways, connected people across the globe. Medical discoveries saved millions of lives. New artificial fertilizers meant we could feed more people. Population rose rapidly. But this was nothing compared with what was to come. The 1950s marked the beginning of the Great Acceleration. Globalization, marketing, tourism, and huge investments helped fuel enormous growth. People swarmed to cities, which became even more powerful engines of creativity. In a single lifetime,
the well-being of millions has improved beyond measure. Health, wealth, security, longevity, never have so many had so much, yet one billion are malnourished. In a single lifetime, we have grown into a phenomenal global force. We move more sediment and rock annually than all natural processes, such as erosion and rivers. We manage three quarters of all land outside the ice sheets. Greenhouse gas levels this high have not been seen for over one million years. Temperatures are increasing. We have made a hole in the ozone layer. We are losing biodiversity. Many of the world's deltas are sinking due to damming, mining and other causes. Sea level is rising. Ocean acidification is a real threat. We are altering Earth's natural cycles. We have entered the Anthropocene, a new geological epoch dominated by humanity. This relentless pressure on our planet risks unprecedented destabilization. But our creativity, energy and industry offer hope. We have shaped our past. We are shaping our present. We can shape our future. You and I are part of this story. We are the first generation to realize this new responsibility. As the population grows to nine billion, we must find a safe operating space for humanity, for the sake of future generations. Welcome to the Anthropocene. We are at this uh, historic time, as this video speaks of the changes after 1950, the Acceleration is very high of the changes in every sphere of our life. And this is a changing epoch. What is the role of religious? We cannot remain with the same way as we have been unless we contribute to this changing time with the gifts that we have, the gifts proper to religious life. And uh, in order to do that, we also need to seek some of the patterns of the history of consecrated life, epochal changes. One of the others speak of uh, epochal changes in religious life every 300 years. This uh, Murchu, one book of uh, religious life in the 21st century. He gives this model, 300 to 600 Egyptian monastic models, and it was destroyed by Vandals and Islam. Um, with that, it closed. Then came the Benedictine era, two times, it took the regeneration. We will take it together. And then the mendicant orders, Franciscans, Dominicans, when there was a stability and, uh, you know, again, a kind of a lethargy in this gospel mystic. And then the apostolic era, Jesuits with the Reformation, and the missionary era era when many of our congregations were founded. We shall have a quick look into that, just to show that how again religious life you know, re-emerges in different ways with its own proper mission in the changing context. And sometimes the price has been very much, not because of its own fault, but it could be even from the changing paradigms and views in the world, especially the big epochal changes like Reformation, then came French Revolution and communism you know, and killed, killed thousands. Well, from in the, there was an, a very flourishing monastic life when people you know, went away in order to follow Christ closely and that took different rigid forms. There were some 5,000 monks in, a, in one area of Egypt and then there were thousands in Syria, Palestine, and the life of self-denial and mortification, and it was destroyed by barbarians and Islamic conquests, etc. In the medieval monasticism, I will put it together, the Benedictine, both the initial and the uh, reformed ones with Cluny, and then the Cistercians, they are reformed Benedictine orders. Monasteries were the keystone to the stability of European society. Maybe the barbarian 
you know, Europe became more civilized to the contribution of these monasteries, which gave stability and then education, and they were the kind of seeds of growth and learning, and the great libraries and uh, you know, translations of Bible and Monasteries were the keystone, and Cluny ultimately had about 1,400 dependencies under centralized rule of which about 200 were very power, important establishment. The Cistercians and their Senate had 742 monasteries and about 900 nunneries. You can imagine how the Europe was you know, accompanied in its own, coming out of a kind of barbarian world to a more educated world. This is the uh, Cluny, model of the Cluny. And with the French Revolution, the people made it into a quarry. They took away stones to build houses and destroyed because of the hatred to religion and all the properties of the religious were easy, uh, easy gains for warring, for the war, as well as for the new emerging, the so-called uh, uh, deprived groups to have, also because of the so-called wealth of the church. The mendicant era, that was the time of Franciscans and particularly you know, and Dominicans. And you know, in a short time, in 12 years, when the first chapter of the Franciscans, about 3,000 to 500, 5,000 they estimate. Now that's a big difference, you no? Know, 3,000 to 5,000. 5, Maybe there was nobody to take an uh, exact number, so they are, different people say different numbers. Dominicans were about 13,000 by 1256. Reformation marked the end of this mendicant era. And, uh, and there were revolutionary changes which affected seriously the religious. We'll have a look into that, particularly if from Protestant Revolution, Reformation. Luther could not appreciate the vows and he preached against consecrated life. Lots of monks and nuns left or escaped to Catholic regions. For Luther, celibate religious life as an ideal was non-scriptural, unnatural, harmful, led to sin and hypocrisy and must be eliminated. In reformed lands to lands the closing of male and female religious houses was a top priority and also an easy no, access to wealth and the gospel of, the, of domesticity was preached, marriage was reinforced. It also deprived of the great things the nuns were doing to the society and the possibility for women. Luther married Catherine and they had six children. He said he married also to revenge Pope, not to show. And there are the reasons they say. And even in the midst of it, you will see a lot of saints. There's also an interesting story of a chronicle of this gene that you see. Poor players of Geneva, they were speaking how that they lived those times when people were ridiculing and then doing everything to make them quit their convent, but they resisted, but ultimately they had to go. And there's a beautiful book on that. Henry VIII, in England, the same wave continued again with his own issues and then the need for money. And, uh, and the, the, on one side, there was a kind of inner you know, luxury and wealth, and therefore a kind of a lethargy, and the gospel mystic is lost. On the other side, there were other reasons. Henry VIII suppressed monasteries, priories, and convents, and priories in England, to increase the income of the crown and to fund Henry's military campaigns. 900 religious houses in England at that time, 260 for monks, 300 for regular canons, etc. 12,000 people in total, 4,000 monks, 3,000 canons, and you know, it was another world. You know, and one adult man in 50 was religious. Monasteries were lax, comfortably worldly, wasteful of scarce resources, and superstitious. Well, there is a picture of how people came and then removed all the wealth of it. And that also provided saints and men who stood for values like Thomas Moore and Fisher. They were canonized. But then this movement could not stop even in the faction of Protestant world. There are also many returned afterwards to consecrated life. 
there are anglican benedictine nuns anglican sisters of bethany and in germany there are protestant nuns and monks here are some in us so retreat house where um, anglican and which is uh, um, receiving people in an ecumenical way these have some pictures of the convents of the protestant uh, convents and the uh, and uh, monasteries and they follow naturally basically this recently some people even joined the catholic church because they found that the tradition of it french revolution was one of the terrible ones which hit very badly religious life it exiled 30000 priests and killed hundreds of priests the revolution we started a new era from the date of revolution and promoted a religion of supreme being and the atheistic cult of reason you there is a big into that this is a nonsat being guillotined on the other side there is this luxury like city and the commodity on one side maybe on the other side there are political and economic reasons of the 300000 consecrated men in europe in 1773 fewer than 70000 remained by 1825 another one is the russian revolution which also killed so many and suppressed and with an atheistic world view which so religion as the enemy of human human progress spanish civil war communist and anarchist uprisings in a very politically very complex situation 6832 clerics including 13 bishops and uh, 4000 and above priests and religious nuns were less in this list 283 because they used them for any social work and so the men section was the most hated we lost about 172 traditions most of them young because they refused to give up their cassock and many of them were uh, they are beatified another eclipse time is after with the vatican council within the internal church uh, in 1965 was a time of boom and then men religious were 3029 women religious 961000 and above in 50 years worldwide decrease 33% between 1970 and 20 or 70% drop between for the women section no in usa 70% of drop in 2015 there are 98 women congregations with more than 1000 members and there are 41 congregations with more than 1000 members so many went through a very drastic change let's see some of the statistics men religious from 65 to 2015 reduced to 199000 and the women religious you no know, about you no know, one group 39 percent less other one 44000 percentage lesser let's take some male congregations like just use they lost about 53 in this period of 50 years 53 percentage salations about 30.7 percentage friars 49.5 benedictines 42 in this 50 years time an example daughters of charity the biggest female congregation they lost about 64.5 percentage salvation sisters 30.4 carmelites had a lesser they had 5.1 and clarices of the franciscan clarice they 105 percent less due to two reasons one is less people entering and then many people leaving and then all the age is at well why is all this happening you know this present struggle let us look at the data of the consecration life from different angles lot of theories are there we have a quick look look into it and you have your own and i would make my own comments at the end one thing is historical comments or analysis sociological ecclesial and theological each one and maybe there is some truth in everything 
and there may be a greater truth still behind first historical decline and recovery this they say they, they are not a kind of a pattern of growth and decline and the need for new enthusiastic or refounding people once vibrant and passionate communities you know fell into a kind of institutionalized uh, commodity etc decline and De declining mechanism and thus fail to meet new challenges. There were some mistakes. Decline followed by new forms of growth and renewed presence of older institutes. Once vibrant communities lose their radical novelty and suffer routinization of charism, or domest domestication of charism. Choice between three options, evolution, continuous development, mutation, or dissolution. These are some of the comments of them. Typical attitudes of institutes in decline, despair, cynicism, self-interest, hopelessness, helplessness, and worthlessness, etc. Resilience depends on the ability to reinterpret the original intentions of the founders. Sociological, they speak that professionalization of the apostolate and the rise of secular opportunities for women in society caused by cause a specific decline of religious life. So secularization professionalization and increasing opportunities for women. Some people say that when there is more poverty, there is more occasion, etc. You hear a lot of these theories. It's true that there are more opportunities. Previously, religious life was a great opportunity for women to have you know, writers, which we have wonderful women saints. Now more opportunities of, for women in the society. Sudden growth of cities, education, and jobs for women, individual freedoms, etc., and the family size is lesser, few children, individualism, authority defiance, and materialism, decreasing number of religious teachers that can assert influence on the youth when the catechism is no more, conduct with this possibility is lesser. Many sisters finally felt free to leave the monastery without the risk of being shamed by society, disappointing their parents and families. So leaving is not a big problem. It's a respectable reorientation. Previously, that was terrible. New ele electronics such as television, mobile phones, so another philosophy of life is more prevalent. Educated religious less inclined to be obedient to a non-educated superior problem of obedience. Right now, when I asked one of us who was working in the, in the Vatican religious life place, what are the major issues, mostly issues of community life, this individualism, which brushes one against the other. More women became economically independent of their family or convent. All these seem to have caused. Next, ecclesial, the Vatican second. A new ecclesiology of a universal call to holiness as is presented in Lumen Gentium. So the previous idea of looking for perfection and any trouble to take and then have heaven. Now you can have heaven and perfection also in ordinary life. Then why should I be religious? In one stroke, the council nullified the basic ideological foundation for 18 centuries of Roman Catholic religious life. One other is saying that comment. The feeling of superiority over the laity became less prominent after the council. So genuine spiritual reasons and ideals for entering increased. Practices and convictions that were crucial for generating and sustaining vocations were abandoned by the council and adopted a worst of both worlds position. You do not have heaven there especially. And here also you are a miserable life. No sex, no money, no, no freedom. No, came to, and then naturally people become terrible. No, the Vatican's attempt for renewal and their wrong interpretation maybe there was in their big preparation, so it was a big shock. And in the first uh, 20 years, a lot of people left. Then people, there was more you no know, reading into it, and then there was a stability. And then came this uh, recent issues of the past sins you know, by the uh, minors, the, the abuse of minors issue came and broke to purify us, I believe. Uh, so reduce. Uh, yeah. 
Uh, okay, I will read. I will say just this. So we have that reason plus theological. The main reason is that the old theological understanding of religion, religious life, could not sustain, and the new one was not integrated properly, which leaving us into a kind of a a, a crisis situation. I will leave this one. So the in, in the incarnational and holistic theology of Vatican dismissal of spiritual dualism. So we are in an era of a, a depth and possibility to embrace a holistic theology where we have to play our own proper role in the orchestration of the church's life and mission. Then the ecology of the church, finding our proper place without denying our body or this world, but becoming also a sign of the other world, the transcendence. Good. How do you respond to this crisis? You wears your congregation and consecrated life itself in our times. Is crisis an opportunity for grace and growth? What awaits consecrated life in the emerging future? This is a question of the bird is in your hand, the part of human, and his life depends on you. You, in the sense, each one of us, for giving life to our provinces, becoming relevant, God's part, God does. And this is a challenge for us to be true. I suggest uh, two, three things. Uh, Nobel, um, Rob, Robin, can I take seven minutes now? Yes, Father. Or yes, we will stop. Yeah, uh, no, seven minutes you can take, just then. Hmm? Enkindle, okay. enkindle and leave your prophetic charism. The relevance of consecrated life is its unique role in the orchestration of the life and mission of the church in the world. A consecrated person who lost the prophetic spirit is like a domesticated lion. I'm giving an imagery for you to think of. You know, our life is to be challenged, but to wake up as the Pope was using that word. We need deep roots to withstand storms by internalizing vocational values. Rootless enthusiasm will not last. Recently, the one of the Carmelites was saying, you know, we have produced a film on our founder, which may be more realistic to his own situation. Then uh, the one Monsignor Franciscan was saying, you know, this Fratelli, the brother, son, and uh, sister Moon, a romantic film on Francis Assisi, motivated so many people to enter Franciscans, and they left shortly. Because what was in the romantic film was not what is lived inside. Consecrated life needs its proper spiritual, psychological, intellectual, moral, rational, and charismatic competencies to joyfully live the call. And it is the work of the spirit in, in a, in, of Christ, spirit of Christ in a cooperating person. Community life, poverty, all these needs, not just weak roots. We need a solid roots. And the center is our intimacy with Christ. Then the various other competencies, which is why we have longer formation, but uh, it will, if we don't take care, it will not, no, we have rootless religious. Third, this is a time of humble perseverance. No, we cannot ask how many people are we, we are better than others, no competitions. This is a time of humble acceptance of our beauty of life to credibly witness, credible witnessing and collective discernment of what the Lord is asking us today. The role of Anavi, the poor of Yahweh, the remnant of Israel is the, maybe a key for us. Sometimes some people say the lean cow of the dream of, but uh, I think Daniel interpreted, no? a time when the surprises of the spirit of the risen Lord awaits us. I want to give also a small uh, three, two and a half minutes video, to say how the spirit once that is alive can create new out of hopeless situations. Another video, you know, orchestra to conclude this session. This is a music from out of the rubbles. Mi nombre es Ada Maribel Ríos Bogado, tengo 13 
13 años y tocó el violín. Me llamo Juan Manuel Chávez, más conocido como Eddie. Tengo 19 años y toco el chelo. Este chelo está hecho de una lata de aceite, la madera tirada en la basura y las clavijas son de una vieja cuchara para golpear la carne y para hacer el ñoquis. Y suena así. <risa> Una comunidad como Caldeura no es un lugar para tener un violín. De hecho, el violín, un violín cuesta más que su casa. En ese grupo acá mismo encontramos el colado de violín. Y de ese empezamos los instrumentos reciclados. La familia que acá vive recicla todo lo que hay en la basura y se vende. No pensaba antes que yo voy a hacer esa instrumento. Y me siento demasiado feliz cuando estoy viendo a un niño que está tocando un violín reciclado. Cuando ya escucho el sonido del violín, siento como mariposa en el estómago, así una sensación que no sé cómo voy a explicar. Bueno, la orquesta de instrumentos reciclados es una orquesta que toca instrumentos hechos con la basura. Un, dos, tres, y... La gente se da cuenta que no tenemos que tirar la basura muy fácilmente. Y no tenemos que desechar a las personas muy fácilmente. ¡Fuerte, fuerte! So finally, the core question of consecrated life comes from the risen Lord. Do you love me more than all this? Consecrated life has a role to play in this changing times, changing epoch. And this is, I think, our role today to descend together and do our best. And I come back to the verse of St. Thomas when the disciples were afraid to visit Jesus who went to Lazarus. And Thomas said to the rest of the disciples, let us also go that we may die with him. The end, but it is the beginning of a new phase. Okay, thank you.